I'm Carlos Hales, and again, we're going to talk about the binder driver in Rust. Uh, let's get started. Let's see. Sure. All right. So, a bit of background um, for people who aren't aware of how Binder works. Uh, it's, you know, Binder communicates two processes. It's a channel of communication, um, the main channel of communication in Android. Uh, it's basically an IPC with some RPC-like features. And it's pretty old, it's not new. Uh, it comes from BOS, uh, it used to be called OpenBinder. Uh, and then it was completely restructured uh, when it was introduced to Linux via Android. Uh, and it's, it's used pretty widely in Android uh, because it's the main access to lots of the framework services. Uh, it, breaks, it breaks into multiple layers, uh, mainly the, the, the driver portion, which is the binder driver. And then there's a user space library called libbinder. And uh, there's some other abstraction layers on top. It's highly abstracted. This is the main model. Um, there's, you know, a service and then there's, you got a bunch of clients on the left trying to communicate, send requests to the service. And the way that the service is going to handle these requests is it has a thread pool, a bunch of threads, and it's going to try to request, uh, try to service all these requests from the, from the clients, um, in parallel. And it's, it's going to set up this memory map region. Uh, so that clients can write their messages or, or transactions, uh, how we call them in, in, in Binder, uh, into this memory map. What's, what's unique about Binder? Um, it has this, like, no in-kernel buffering. Um, so as, as, as shown in the previous slide, uh, you know, the, the, the client through the driver is going to take this user memory and copy it directly into the server's uh, user memory, uh, no, no buffering in the kernel, right? This, this is a direct uh, memory exchange. Uh, it also does uh, all the operations via um, IO control, uh, including a single, you know, write and read command in a single Ayakto. Um, it implements also priority inheritance. Um, you, you know, th these are, uh, sometimes synchronous transactions, or so in order to not block uh, the clients, we need to inherit the priority on the server side. Uh, it performs uh, this sharing and, and, and translation of file descriptors. Uh, it has a bunch of object management um, uh, procedures like weak and strong, and strong reference counting. Uh, clients also can subscribe uh, to get notified uh, if a particular service dies and just, you know, a bunch of features. So, so why rewrite it? What is the problem? Complexity, right? Uh, all these features packed into this small little uh, module creates a high complex uh, structure that it's really hard to maintain. Uh, you know, there's a lot of risk involved with making changes. So this accumulates technical debt. Um, there's no reward. There's no incentive on uh, refactoring things. And all this leads to vulnerabilities, security issues, bugs, right? You can't, we're not gonna be able to restructure the code without incurring into some, uh, some major bug. And, and um, you know, this is not theoretical, right? Like statistics are there and, and um, we just get a bunch of bugs that in chain are turning to uh, this high exploit. And, um, you know, it's, it's a very vulnerable code in terms of density. And it's not, it's not a ramp down either of a new thing. There's bugs, you need to ramp them down. It's not like that. It's, 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 keep, it's been keeping an average of bugs uh, throughout time stable. And, uh, you know, it seems, it seems like Binder should be pretty secure because it's part of the uh, like Android sandboxing 
and which is you know supposed to be a security feature and so it's critical that it remains secure again all these complicated features must also be implemented in a fast and efficient manner um, and and you know every time we try to change tweak things to be done in the right way uh, there's a some sort of performance regression and noticeable performance regression uh, that users, you know, see it janked in their phone or something like that. So it's complicated. If you, if you open up the driver, you'll see that uh, there's this thousand line functions. I'm, I'm, I'm not kidding. It is, it is thousand line functions. Um, and you know, similar error handling during the, or unwinding, um, and, and, you know, it's, it's, it's tricky, right? Like, uh, making, making changes, refactoring all of this is tricky. Uh, we've seen this in the past before every, every, every time we try to refactor things, there's always a bug associated with that refactoring later on, later down the road. And then there's a fix to the fix and a fix to the fix and so on, right? Like there's this big change of fixes that are just crazy. And yeah, the, the idea is that, you know, we don't want to keep changing or, or chasing after uh, these memory bugs forever. So All right. Thank you, Carlos, for introducing why we want to do this. So um, now it's my turn. Carlos has talked about the C binder implementation. I'd like to talk about the Rust implementation. So, you know, we already talked a little bit about this, but, you know, one of the places where I think Rust makes a really big difference for a driver like Binder comes with ownership semantics of pointers. So here we have an example where here on the left, we have real code from CBinder where we have this function. Then at the top, we have this assertion saying that the caller should have a temporary reference. And so if we don't, we catch it at runtime. Or maybe you don't catch it at all. Uh, in Rust, you encode these, this kind of thing into the function signature every single time you take a pointer. And so the code is both self-documenting and the compiler enforces that these annotations are correct. Um, here's, another ex here's another example. So first we saw function signatures, but we all, the same applies to structs. So here on the left, we have a struct from binder with a lot of pointers and then you might ask, okay, so this pointer, is that, does that own a reference count? Does it, is it just kept alive because the code frees one before the other? Um, is it ownership? Like what's going on? You can't see that from the code, but in Rust you can because you use different pointer types for each case. Um, it's similar with nullability. You know, here we have a comment that says, oh, these can be set to null, but in Rust, we actually have a different type. We wrap it in option to handle that case. And so, you know, in the struct, whether it's nullable or not and so on. So there are many cases of this. Another case, I think, where <laughs> 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 the slide speaks for itself, I think. <laughs> You can't actually see this because this, the site was cut off, but this is a one third of the, the cleanup actually. It's goes, it keeps going. Um, yeah, I, I will, it seems like it spoke for itself, so I will not go on with the slide. <laughs> so this is um, interesting. So, you know, Rust does not prevent all mistakes, right? The Rust promises to make some classes of mistakes a lot less likely, you know, 
if you have no unsafe, it promises to make them impossible, but you know, in the kernel, we will have unsafe. So for us, the promise is we make these classes of vulnerabilities a lot less likely. Here in Binder, we see that, for example, use after free. Those do not happen in safe Rust. Um, those have out of bounds. You know, it's we don't prevent you from doing an out of bounds on an array, but still, if you do that in C, now you have a vulnerability. If you do that in Rust, it's just going to call it bug. And so, even though we did not per se prevent the mistake, we still made it a lot less severe. Oh, we wrote a Rust implementation because of these things. Um, it's at feature parity. We have all of the features in CBinder are already implemented in Rust. And it passes all of the tests. And furthermore, we can boot a device and run a variety of apps. <laughs> <laughs> and furthermore, we don't just have a working driver that's correct. At least I hope it's correct, you know. <laughs> we also have good performance. Uh, as you can see here, we have some graphs, and it turns out that the performance is on par, at least on this benchmark. You know, it turns out that, you know, we don't promise that Rust will be faster than C, but you should be able to write code that's as fast. That's the idea anyway. And in this case, it took a bit of optimization to get here, but we were actually able to do it. And so, I mean, you know, C, C, has, C binder has also had a lot of optimization. So, you know, it's not unreasonable that we had to do the same. So, yeah, you know, this is only a micro benchmark. There's still a lot of work to be done on the performance front, and there is a, we will do a lot more work on this front to also like, you know, what actually matters is I click, how long does it take, right? That, that's what matters to users, right? They don't care about the binder throughput test benchmark. But still, I think uh, it's very promising. Code size. You know, there are some places where Rust is more verbose than C, in part because, well, there are a bunch of invariants that we write down in code, but they're in implicit in C. And, you know, there are many reasons. But, for example, on error handling, we spend less code. And it turns out that, in this case, it's about the same number of lines of code. So, uh, that's also interesting. Go ahead. This is uh, excluding comments. Um, if you read the IFC, so you know th this code is available on the mailing list in an IFC that we sent out. In the IFC, we outline what exactly was measured here. We like this is uh, you know without empty lines and so on and so forth. Um, you can also look at the bottom of the patch set, and you will see that we actually delete more lines of code than we add. So that's pretty cool. And of course, that one is with comments. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but what about unsafe? Because, you know, Rust in the kernel is going to have unsafe. But it turns out that, for the case of Binder at least, we didn't need very much. And the unsafe we have in Binder is mostly because Binder is not entirely written in Rust. This binder has a module called bindrfs, where we just kept whatever was in the C implementation. And most of this unsafe code is actually related to talking between the Rust part and the C part of binder. Now, there's also the abstractions, which, for example, this includes the work queue. To use the work queue from binder, I had to write a wrapper around the work queue in Rust code. 
And there are a whole bunch of these. We call them abstractions. And you know, when you just have one driver in the kernel, then th that then we actually end up with a lot of unsafe because these abstractions are mostly unsafe. They just call it to see all the time. But you know, these are the kind of things that you can reuse across many drivers. So unlike the red region, which is per driver, this yellow region does not scale with the number of Rust drivers. I think, no. So in some sense, you only have to get the work queue bindings right once. So um, one of the friends from my office, you know, I was telling him about all of the many different things that Binder does. And this is what he had to say. So yeah. Now, this is where I had intended to end the talk. But during Plumber, something happened that I have to address. <laughs> because we received an email from one of the you know, vulnerability bug hunters that have the name on several of the CFinder vulnerabilities. Uh, and they found a vulnerability in the Rust Binder IFC we had sent out. So, uh, so yeah. Um, this vulnerability, it's some sort of logic error where when you send a transaction, we make some changes and then we find out that the transaction is actually invalid. And then we undo the changes in, in the wrong way, basically. And it turns out that CBinder actually had a vulnerability, which is almost the exact same vulnerability. So we can compare them and see what went wrong and like what was the consequences in C and what were the consequences in Rust. Um, and what happened in C is that by triggering this problem, you can pretty easily get to a use after free. So now you have a use after free in the kernel and you know, I'm a security person, as far as I'm concerned, it's game over. Um, in Rust, we did not end up with a use after free. There was no use after free, no out of bounds access. What we had instead is that, you know, it was a logic error and we don't promise to prevent those. And we end up, there's this mapping from these IDs to these objects in the kernel. And we could change the mapping for a different process so that it gets confused about which IDs correspond to which objects. And, you know, that's pretty bad. Like, in the end, this vulnerability is actually a pretty bad vulnerability, and it's probably also game over. But you know, I think it's a good example because we saw that in Rust, we actually prevented the memory safety part of it, which is what we promised. In this case, there was also a logic error that we didn't prevent. But I still think it's really interesting to see that in some sense, this vulnerability was less severe. I, I think at least it was harder to exploit. So yeah. All right. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>
What are some of the learnings that you can give back to the community? It, you know, this is one of the bigger Rust projects in the kernel right now, or the largest, I think. Um, it, what have you learned along the way and how can the community, you know, focus this effort on in, including more Rust? Yeah, you know, I had to write a lot of findings for different things and I think it would be nice to, you know, I think you have to, when you begin, like the places where you begin to use Rust, you know, that should be the places where you get the most bang for the buck, like the places in the code that are the most critical. Um, and then, of course, at some point, I'd like to see drivers that are simple, but maybe, st but maybe still done pretty quickly. Maybe we could also write those. I don't know. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, you mentioned you had a, a ton of abstractions, and that's kind of part that you added. Um, you, you said on the slide you had to write them once. So I was wondering, during the course of your write of binder, did the C side of the APIs change that much? And then did you have to go make adjustments to your abstractions? Oh, whether the C side changed while I worked on it? Yeah. Um, the freezing stuff did, like the, with process freezing, I think. I think that was the only thing that changed. Okay. In, in general, when the change is made on the C side. Yeah, yeah. So I, there I was some change in the C side for how process freezing worked. Yeah. Um, but I think that was it. Okay. So I, I've been working on this for a year now. So yeah. over a year, we had one th place. So I think that's interesting. Yeah. Too bad. Just, just to make things clear, uh, the last patch set completely deletes the C version. So there's there's no like uh, parallel intention yeah. of maintenance. So. Right, right. I, I'm talking about the uh, the Rust abstractions to the other kernel APIs that you're using, right? So, yeah. so in, one note that is in general what we want to do, and this is a common question that we get, right, for, for abstractions in general in the kernel. What we want to do is, and what we are doing, and we are asking maintainers is, we go to the maintainers of the actual C side, mm -hmm. and they are the ones that have to say yes or no, and they we want that they maintain the code. So when they know when the C side changes and they, they know they have to update the, update the Rust side. And for example, uh, I talk about that in, in, in Monday, but one example is, for example, uh, uh, Matthew Wilcox was, for example, happy to commit to maintain both sides, even if he had to re-implement some functions on the Rust side, because he, he said, well, I will implement it and I will just keep it in sync myself. So that's basically the best case scenario. And that's what we aim for. We, we need the maintainers to, to be on board. Yeah. Okay. So I had a question. Suppose that um, you, you upstream the work cube abstractions, right? Um, yes, that was free. So that, that's pretty cool. But suppose now I want to change the way work cubes work. And being, you know, one of the old dyed in the wool kernel developers, I don't really understand the rust side of it. And I don't know how to fix that part of it. And um, I break it. Right. Whose problem is that at that point? How does that get fixed? How do we address problems like that that are certainly going to happen at some point? So, so I think the general answer is uh, the maintainers of the working, in this case, uh, Tejun, needs to be aware of the changes when he receives the patches. And he has to have some knowledge on the right side to, to fix, if needed, uh, the, the other side. So in the end, we need the maintainers to know some Rust, at least, to be able to uh, uh, change the right side as well. So if it is someone that is not a maintainer and wants to si change the seaside, then yes, then uh, uh, there is a egg, uh, chicken and egg problem there where we, we need developers to start uh, learning Rust uh, if we want Rust in the kernel to, to succeed and to be maintainable. So in the end, we yes, we expect that kernel developers, if this is successful, we expect that there is some level of Rust uh, knowledge uh, in, in most maintainers uh, and also developers, if possible. So someone asked about the uh, positive fallout and uh, and what Alice had I think yeah uh, had learned and at, at least uh, I know that um, I've been using the uh, work queue bindings that Alice did to the patterns she applied there in uh, to in designing abstractions for other uh, things where we have these intrusive structures uh, so that's that at least is something that has come out of it and is reusable 
across different uh, APIs. Yeah, I just wanted to say, are we planning to nominate a Rust maintainer and a C maintainer for some subsystems? So some subsystems uh, do actually uh, may, may actually want to do that. And for example, I think in NetDev, uh, they are going to have a new maintainer entry, maintainers file entry, where they will list uh, uh, the people responsible for the Rust part. So in that case, uh, it's another solution for what John was asking. And in that case, if you have somebody that at least uh, knows the Rust side, then the only thing that you need, which maybe is still too much, but the only thing you need is communication between the two sets of maintainers uh, and be aware that uh, uh, basically the Rust side in the beginning, I would recommend that they review all the patches that go to the C side in case somebody forgets to update the, the Rust side, right? Uh, some, some cases of course are obvious because it breaks the, the, the compiler will complain. Others are more subtle, so you can still break things and you don't detect them if you change you know, the post conditions of a function in the C side, of course, uh, you need to uh, change the, the Rust side uh, if, if you rely on that, right? So there are several, it, it will depend case by case. The maintainers of each subsystem needs to decide how they want to approach it if they want to uh, start using Rust uh, in their uh, in their side of the kernel. I think everybody uh, probably wants to go to break. I, I guess nobody is going out, so this is, uh, I guess, <laughs> they really, really want to hear what uh, is going on, but uh, I don't want to keep you here uh, for the break. Uh, we have some minutes in the break. Ah, there is one question for Nick. And this, let's say, the last one. Uh, I was curious, uh, is cross-language LTO something that you've done performance testing on yet for binder throughput tests? So, yes, but I, I think my test, I'm not sure whether my benchmark was correct. <laughs> but, but on the benchmarks, I did see a difference. But um, I've since gotten a little confused about what was going on. So I, I think I have to redo them. Okay. So if you stick around for the next talk, uh, there's also some LTO stuff. Oh, cool. <laughs> uh, again, I'm very